Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Terry Cole Show that I'm going to start with a question. Are you a natural born helper? Right? Are you always willing to lend a hand or jump in when something is needed? Yeah, you're nodding your head. Well, then this video is for you because I'm going to be breaking down compulsive helping, not that helpful, when helping is unhelpful. Like when is it not actually helping? And I'm going to give you some ideas of what you can do instead of auto helping. So before we get into it, if you are new to my channel, well, hello and welcome. Please introduce yourself in the comments because we are a friendly crew. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell because I want you to get notified when I put out new stuff, which is at least twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I don't want you to miss a thing. So if you don't know me, my name is Terry Cole. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, a relationship expert, and the author of Boundary Boss, which you can get at boundarybossbook.com. I also love to acknowledge you and say thank you so much for all of your questions and your comments. We have a really active comment section on this YouTube channel, so thank you because you know I read every single one and I love to highlight them. So today I'm highlighting the name is Coyote and it was under Money, Mindset and Manifestation with Alison Bird, which was an amazing interview that I did, which if you didn't watch, you should. She wrote powerful video, great conversation. I'm glad I subscribed to this channel. And wow, Coyote, I'm glad you subscribed to this channel as well. All right, so let's move into today's content. What is helping and what is unhelpful? helping. That's really what we're talking about because so much of the time we see ourselves as nice people and we are nice people. I always want to help people, but there is a line, a tipping point where the helping itself pushes over into not really being about the other person, but really being about what you need, right? You need to see yourself as a helper. This also sort of folds into a lot of codependent behaviors. So let's just start with some examples of unhelpful helping, unsolicited advice giving. Are you the person who is always there offering suggestions or problem solving for someone else? Is that you really? And be honest with yourself. Listen, there's nothing to feel bad about. What do we do in, in my podcast and my channel? What, what are we doing? Raising our awareness about why we do the things that we do so that whatever we're doing in life, we can mindfully choose to do that. Another symptom of unhelpful helping is checking in on people all the time. Are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? Constantly asking if someone needs help, even if they've already said that they don't. So frequent checking in is another one. Another thing is if you are overly soothing, like it's going to be okay, or are you sure you're okay with that face that stays like concerned for a long time, right? Again, the person has said, I'm okay. And it's like pushing the envelope. Another thing is the auto fixing, just offering to take over for someone else, or I can do that, or I can do it for you. And again, this may feel like you're being helpful. But what is missing in this equation of being unhelpfully helpful, in quotes, is understanding how the other person feels. So this auto fixing, this auto advice giving, again, so much of that falls under codependency. So let's talk a little bit about why we do it. And then I'll give you some ideas of things that you can do instead. So think about it for yourself. If this is resonating with you, why do you think you do that? Well, a lot of my therapy clients would say, well, I see myself as a helpful person because I like to be needed. I've heard that zillions of times in my career as a therapist. I like to be needed. It feels good to be needed. Here's the thing. If we are sort of pushing our help on someone else, then are we really being needed or are we doing what we need to do, which is to feel needed? What is really happening? If we break down codependency, as many of you know, which I'll talk about a little bit though, because this is a big part of unhelpful helping, is that we are overly invested in the feeling states, the situations, the decisions, the relationships, the outcomes of the people in our lives. There's so many myths out there about codependency, but what a lot of people don't know is that it's really an overt or a covert bid 
to control a situation, someone else's situation. So in your mind, you may go, no, I just, they're in pain and I just want them to be out of pain. But this is where we need to understand boundaries, our own emotional boundaries, that someone else's life, even if it's a grown child or your best friend, that is their life to manage. We can be supportive, we can be helpful, we can be loving, but when you are an auto advice giver, what you're really saying underneath auto advice giving basically is, I know better. I know what you should do more than you know what you should do. And even if a friend comes to you and says, I don't know what to do, that's okay. You know, Deepak Chopra says the infinite possibilities of your life are in the not knowing, are in the unknown. In the unknown, everything is possible. Now that might sound super esoteric, but there's truth in it. And the only way, think about how you come to decisions in your life. The only way to really come to them for yourself is we must be in the pain of the unknown, of the I'm afraid to make a mistake or of the I hope I don't choose the wrong quote unquote decision. But again, that whole thing is a process. And what I find, at least in my own life, in my 20s, I was highly codependent. Many of you know this, but with like everybody, not, not just the close people in my life. I could become codependently invested in literally anybody from my mail carrier to my hairstylist, where if anybody was in pain, I didn't like it. Like I took on the weight of the world, but in doing so, I was trampling on the emotional boundaries and the sovereignty of other people. So it's not about having a bad motive. So if this is you, if you are someone who is a perpetual perennial helper of others, if you're a fixer, if you're the one everyone comes to, or if you're the one who offers, even when no one's asking, that doesn't make you a bad person, but you're doing it for a reason. And here's the thing. If you can't not do it, if it is a compulsive reaction to how you are feeling about the other person being in distress, which is what it is so much of the time, there are so many unconscious processes that are going on when we are helping, quote unquote, or fixing, quote unquote, that we're uncomfortable with what is happening. Here's the reason why I'm doing an episode on this is that it is really damaging to our relationships. Because what happens when I am in my 20s, when I was auto advice giving all over town to everyone in the world, when someone came to me and they had a problem, I was almost always inserting myself into the middle of their situation, but I was inserting myself as the solution. And I would go to great lengths, like almost any length to get it done, quote unquote, because that person's distress was so distressing to me. Now, why are we like this? Why does this happen in my own life? Uh, listen, we all have families. We all grew up in family systems and most of those family systems are dysfunctional. Come on. I don't think I know anyone who came from a functional, quote unquote, like super functional home and didn't have any dysfunction. So in my family system, it was a highly functioning alcoholic system and I was designated the hero child. So even though I was chronologically the youngest, I was psychologically the oldest. So I was put in that position, but I also put myself in that position. So I was the youngest and the family system could agree that I was good and that I was helpful. And so I was set up to be the fixer and the helper and the hero child and the golden child in my family of origin. And interestingly, my mother played that same role in her family of origin. So again, most of these things don't just come out of nowhere. There is a reason why my mother related to me the way that she did. And also I am by nature a helper, right? So there's adaptive ways that we can take this desire to help others and sublimate that into something that is adaptive, like me becoming a psychotherapist, right? So now it is my job to help other people and that's okay. 
because that's what I get paid to do. But it's for me, the challenge was not doing it in my own personal life. And with my clients, I needed to learn to be a healthy helper, right? It wouldn't help my clients if I just gave them answers or told them what I thought that they should do. Obviously, the role of a therapist is helping people come to their own answers because I don't really know what's right for other people to do. My job as a psychotherapist is to help people decode and find the answers within themselves. I always say, I'm nobody's guru, but I'm a damn good GPS to help you to get to the answers that you need for yourself, which would be different than answers that I would need for myself because we're all so unique. So there's millions of reasons why we do this, but it is painful whether you are on the receiving end of an unhelpful helper. Now think about it right now. Do you have people in your life who sort of insist on helping you, even though you don't need help? I give this example sometimes of one of my closest friends and we've been friends for many, many years and this was many, many years ago, but we would travel together and she would grab her suitcase and also grab mine. Like, think about that. She was such an over-functioning, unhelpful helper at the time. I would be like, dude, like I can carry my own bag. And she's like, but I got it. I'm like, but why? That makes no sense. I have a backpack on, I have nothing in my hands. Like it was so ingrained in her. And of course it's no coincidence that we're best friends because we were both so bad at this at the time. And of course, have both had a ton of therapy since then. And we no longer do that. But there's something very depersonalizing. When you're on the receiving end of someone constantly looking at you like you're a problem to be solved, anticipating your needs, doing something before you ask them to do it or doing things that you don't even want them to do. And maybe you're that person doing that for others. And if you are, I guarantee you that you've had experiences where you don't understand why people aren't more grateful, or you don't understand people's negative reaction to your overextending yourself on things. So let's move into what can we do instead? Because there's nothing wrong with being a natural born helper, right? You're kind, You're a lover, so am I. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's get it into a healthy place though. So the first thing is having a deeper understanding of why do you do it for you? Because you have your own why. We all have our own why. I'm gonna give you the secondary gain questions that I have. So you're continuing this behavior. The question is, what do you get to not feel, not face, or not experience by killing yourself, helping other people. What does it do for you? So all of this will be in the guide. Just go to terrycole.com forward slash guide. Because this is where the gems are hidden. A lot of this stuff is unconscious. And there is something that you get out of doing it. It might be avoiding your own life. When I was super high functioning, codependent in my 20s, active in all kinds of relationships, I was exhausted so much of the time. I was using so much bandwidth, taking on the problems of other people. I'll give you another quick example because this one was pretty extreme and pretty painful. I was doing a weekend long training to help rape survivors. So to work in an ER and sort of be someone on call. And there was another person who was there. Now I met her on Saturday during the training. We kind of connected on Sunday. She's like, hey, I'm in a really bad situation. Can I stay with you tonight? I'm in an abusive relationship, blah, blah, blah. I would not say yes now. I would give her other ideas, but I said, yes, I didn't even know this person. And she came to my house on Sunday night with her dog and like five huge suitcases. And I'm not kidding. I mean, she had no intention of leaving and she stayed way more than one night. And it took me so much support for my therapist to get her out. I wasn't even friends with her. I didn't even know her, but I was so overly impacted by her tale of woe and by just seeing someone in need. So that is an extreme example of unhealthy helping because it was bad for me. 
to do that. Not to mention, you know, she could have been a very unstable individual. Maybe she could have harmed me or robbed me, but she didn't do any of those things. And I eventually, I mean, it was a week, but I got her out eventually. But it was so, the whole thing was so painful. And that's all about unhealthy helping, but also having dis, just super disordered boundaries. That really started with a disordered emotional boundary where I was so appalled and terrified for her as she was describing the abuse that she was dealing with that I couldn't protect myself, right? I could only fix because that was the only skill set I had at that point. And when I say fix, those of you listening can't see, I'm saying fixing with quote unquote marks around it. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the secondary gain. And of course, once I started healing from being an overfunctioning, being an overhelper, being a codependent, I realized what I was gaining from that, which was in so many ways avoiding my own life, the things that I needed to handle, the things that I needed to deal with, you know, my own wounds from childhood, where if I could just be superwoman during the day, I didn't have to feel those feelings because that filled me up. It made me feel good about myself. But then I'm always seeking the next person to save, so to speak. All right, so that's the first thing you're gonna do. And the second thing, and I'll provide this to you in the guide, is when someone comes to you with a problem, you have got to learn to stop the auto fixing. We have to learn to ask expansive questions, respect the other person's autonomy, and get it through your mind, the truth that you do not know what anyone else should do really, what really matters is them coming to that themselves. So you can ask, well, what does your gut instinct say? How do you feel about it? What do you think you should do? And then just let it be silent. Let that just sit. And it'll be hard in the beginning to do this, but it is completely possible to do it. Learning how to ask questions. And then the last thing to do is really get dialed into how codependent are you? You may be like me. I'm from the high functioning codependency brand of codependency, which means that you're overly invested in the feeling states, the outcomes, the situations, the relationships, as I said before, of other people. But high functioning means that you're so highly capable that you make it all look easy, that people think it is easy for you, that a lot of times you are the person who's like the rock in your friends group and your family system, you're the people that people come to. So you may not in the past have recognized that that is still codependent behavior. You just happen to be really good at it. So I'm gonna give you a couple of questions in the guide that you can answer, which will give you a better idea of how much of a high functioning codependent you may be. So I hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, please share it with the people in your life. I hope you have an amazing week. And as always, take care of you.